going back to our basic run-of-the-mill type of vertebrae. One feature that I also want to point out are the articular processes. There are two different ones, superior articular processes and inferior articular processes. They are the processes on the bone that this vertebra will use to articulate with a vertebra superior to it or a vertebra inferior to it. If you put your finger in the vertebral foramen and then position the vertebra so that the spinous process is facing you, so you're looking at the posterior side, then the articular processes, smooth uh, facets here, that are facing you are always going to be the superior articular processes. So now we can definitely define that this is a superior direction. It's dangerous sometimes to go with the direction that the spinous process is pointing because on some vertebrae it does point inferiorly, but mm -hmm. some vertebrae it points straight posteriorly. So to define superior, the superior articular processes will always be facing you as you are looking at the posterior side of the vertebra. The articular processes that are facing away from you, that I'm touching with my fingers here, those are always going to be the inferior articular processes. They will always face anteriorly. So you can tell now superior versus the inferior articular processes. So this completes the basic survey of individual vertebra. Now, putting it all together then, we end up with vertebral collar, which is going to protect the spinal cord, serve for muscle attachment, that will bear your weight, be a main protector of your central nervous system, and so forth. And because the intervertebral foramen in between and the articulation between the articular processes of the vertebra, you've got a structure that's quite flexible. They'll protect that spinal cord but still give flexibility so that the torso can bend into various different shapes and forms. Now, if you look at the diagrams, the vertebral columns, the vertebral column always has a characteristic bend to it, characteristic curves to it. I'm trying to get this bent into the way in which it's supposed to look. So if you're looking at the lateral view of the vertebral column, then this is the normal curvature of that vertebral column. We've got a curvature here in the cervical area, in which it's concave if you're looking at it from a posterior direction. The thoracic area is convex if you're looking at it from a posterior direction. The lumbar area is concave if you're looking at it from a posterior direction. And the sacral is convex if you're looking at it from a posterior direction. But these curvatures were not always this way. Before you were born, the entire vertebral column was shaped as a C, being convex if you were to look at it from a posterior view. And so this is the normal curvature of a newborn child. Then several months after birth, when the muscles at the back of the neck on the child's head become strong enough to where that child can hold his or her head upright, then that will permanently create this secondary cervical curvature. So this is caused by the infant holding their head upright. And then when the child's back muscles become strong enough to where they can support themselves when they walk, then the increase in strength of the back muscles will bow the lumbar area of the vertebral column back like so, creating a secondary lumbar curvature created by the child standing and beginning to walk. So therefore, the cervical curvature and the lumbar curvature, I'm calling them secondary because they appear after birth caused by the development of the muscles, where the thoracic curvature is still a primary curvature left over from the original fetal, and likewise the sacral curvature is still primary, left over from the original position as a, as a, as a fetus. As we get older, and I mentioned that these intervertebral discs become thinner, then quite often the anterior sides of those discs will thin out the fastest, especially in the thoracic region, resulting in an, accent, an accentuated thoracic curvature, which then results in a condition that is referred to as kyphosis, better known as hunchback. So therefore, you see a lot of these individuals that are elderly walking hunched over because of the deterioration of the discs. Or another abnormal curvature that is quite common. There's an accentuated lumbar curvature called lordosis, sway back. So the pelvis is all tipped back, and the small of the back of the individual is accentuated. 
This is very common in little girls of grade school age, perhaps kindergarten, first, second, third, and fourth grade. Very common condition for them because usually little girls of that age, their back muscles develop faster than what their abdominal wall muscles. Sit-ups or some, some type of exercise usually will correct this if the condition is, uh, uh, is such that it might be clinically significant. This is also much more common in women as a complication from pregnancy and so forth. If you look at the vertebral column from a posterior view or from an anterior view, it's supposed to be perfectly straight up and down. I'm not sure if this one is since this is kind of flexible a little bit, but it is supposed to be straight like that. Any kind of a lateral curvature in any place in the vertebral column, I got a good one here that I just made, <laughs> is called scoliosis lateral curvature. Uh, again, for some reason, more common in women than in men. And if it is severe enough, then this can create respiratory distress type of problems because the individual cannot mm -hmm. inhale to the full excursion of their thoracic cavity. Um, definitely chronic back problems and so forth. Quite often it can be corrected by traction, or braces, that type of situation. So, the vertebral column. Thank you.